Many thanks to all of those who made this important lecture series possible. I'm so sorry I won't be able to thank you in person and even more disappointed I won't be able to meet the students and other participants who are taking part. And given that speaking in front of a, of a computer just isn't the same as speaking for a live audience, I hope my presentation will nevertheless be um, animated enough to um, uh, keep your, your interest. The case study that I'll be uh, looking at is East Timor, also known as Timor-Leste. It's important both in its own right, but particularly for those of us here in the United States, a country that was complicit in the genocide. That's hard for me to say, and I'm sure it's hard for you to hear. It's undeniably true, however. Furthermore, this isn't something that happened a long time ago. This happened within my lifetime, the lifetime of your parents, and the final chapters within some of your lifetime. And let's remember that not only did this take place under both Republican and Democratic administrations, uh, the US government has never apologized or even acknowledged its role. As a result, we need to be aware that it could happen again. But let me begin with some history. During the early days of colonialism back in the 17th century, the uh, British, Spaniards, Dutch, and Portuguese were all vying for influence in the islands separating the Asian mainland and Australia, known as the East Indies. Portugal ended up with the smallest share, the eastern half of the island of Timor, with the Dutch controlling the western half and almost all the surrounding islands. After World War II, in which East Timor was a key battleground between British and Japanese forces, and a bloody anti-colonial struggle, the Dutch islands became independent as Indonesia in 1949, becoming the fifth most populous country in the world. East Timor, however, remained a Portuguese colony. The uh, authoritarian leader of Indonesia, uh, Sukarno, wanted to unite the uh, East Indies um, he was able to uh, maneuver to bring in West Papua, the western half of the island of New Guinea into, the, uh, into Indonesia in the early 60s. He was pressuring the British uh, to, um, you know, to give up uh, their holdings in the northern part of the island of Borneo, which uh, ended up becoming part of, of Malaysia. He was also, of course, interested in including uh, what was then known as Portuguese Timor. The um, CIA had actually been encouraging rebellions in some of the outer islands as a way of undermining Sukarno, who was, who was a leftist um, leader um, and one who was challenging the prerogatives of traditional colonial powers. Uh, he, was, he was not aligned in the um, uh, Cold War, uh, but they were communists in, in um, Indonesia, a fairly large and powerful communist party. Uh, that was vying for interest, uh, for, for influence, I should say. And on the other side, you had conservative uh, um, uh, Muslim military officers. So Sukarno was getting pressure, he and his nationalists were getting pressure from both the left and the right. But in 1965, there was a right wing coup, and General Suharto came to power and engaged in a, a series of massacres. Uh, among the worst in modern history. As, as many as a half million people were killed, uh, mostly uh, suspected communists and other leftists, as well as ethnic Chinese. Um, nearly a half million other people were jailed uh, for many years. Torture was widespread. Uh, it was a horrifically repressive regime. Uh, but it didn't get much attention, uh, much less condemnation in the Western uh, countries, such as the United States, which was glad to see Sukarno overthrown and the pro-Western General Suharto in power. Indeed, the New York Times, noting how the perceived communist threat had been crushed, unlike in other uh, countries, uh, referred to Indonesia as the bright spot in Asia uh, because of uh, uh, Suharto's success in, in crushing the communist and, and other, other leftists. Meanwhile, while most colonial powers had given up their colonies in Africa and Asia by the 1950s and early 60s, Portugal held on to East Timor, along with five African colonies and a tiny enclave on the southern coast of China. Uh, Portuguese Timor at this point uh, had only about 600,000 people. The Portuguese had practiced kind of a benign neglect. Um, uh, it was a very, very poor country. 
Um, but their, their influence was definitely felt. Um, uh, the uh, most uh, Timorese had adopted Portuguese names, and along with the Philippines, East Timor had become the only predominantly Christian country in Asia. By contrast, Indonesia was 90% Muslim, though uh, religion was not a major factor in the ensuing conflict. Indeed, some of the leading Indonesian military and political figures in the repression were from Indonesia's Christian minority. In 1974, uh, the fascist government that had ruled uh, Portugal for nearly 50 years was overthrown, and a new democratic government began the process of withdrawing from their colonial possessions. In East Timor, there are two uh, national liberation groups, the leftist Revolutionary Front for the Independent of East Timor, uh, known as Fredeline, and the conservative uh, Timorese Democratic Union, known as the UDT. The uh, UDT sta uh, staged a coup attempt in August of 1975, which led to a brief civil war in which the Fredeline decisively won. And they declared East Timor's independence on the 28th of November in 1975. Uh, meanwhile, Indonesian forces had already begun to support a tiny pro-annexationist faction in East Timor, by which most accounts had the support of no more than 5% of the population. A week later, after the Declaration of Independence, this is December 6, 1975, President Gerald Ford and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger visited the Indonesian capital of Jakarta. By all accounts, in the meeting with the Indonesian dictator, Ford gave the green light for full-scale Indonesian invasion of East Timor, uh, which began within 24 hours. Uh, Secretary of State Kissinger publicly stated that the United States, quote, understands Indonesia's position on East Timor, unquote, namely that it not be allowed its right to self-determination <laughs> under international law. And while the United Nations Security Council voted unanimously for Indonesia to halt its invasion and to withdraw to within its internationally recognized borders, the United States, while voting for the resolution, blocked the UN from imposing economic sanctions or any other means of enforcing its mandate. Then US Ambassador to the United Nations, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, later bragged how under State Department instructions, he had made the UN totally ineffectual, in his words in bringing a halt to the invasion. The initial invasion was incredibly brutal. Thousands of civilians were killed in the initial attack, including hundreds of the country's uh, political, cultural, and intellectual leaders who were rounded up and executed. Australian journal journalists and other reporters who, um, who were witnessing the crimes were also killed. Uh, much of the East Timorese population fled into mountain jungles where they're subjected to a draconian siege which led to tens of thousands of deaths from starvation and um, uh, preventable uh, diseases. Uh, there were vir virtually no expressions of concern from the national community during all this. Indeed, during his first year in office in 1977, uh, um, uh, President Jimmy Carter ordered a 79% increase in military aid to Indonesia including deliveries of counterinsurgency aircraft, which allowed the Indonesians to dramatically expand the air war with devastating consequences. And again, the ir irony here is that Jimmy Carter uh, was known for his strong advocacy of human rights in US foreign policy, but uh, this tragically uh, was a glaring exception. By the end of the decade, as many as 200,000 East Timorese, more than a third of the island's population, were dead from Indonesian massacres, forced starvation, and preventable diseases. When, when asked about US laws prohibiting arms transfers to such aggressor nations, a uh, Carter State Department official stated that since Indonesia had annexed East Timor the as its 27th province, the conflict was no longer an invas invasion, but an internal rebellion. As Carter's Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, Richard Holbrook, played a major role in the Carter administration's pro-Indonesia tilt and the military aid package that helped make possible the wholesale slaughter in the late 1970s. He also took part in the Carter administration's cover-up that followed. For example, in testimony before Congress on December, in De in December of 1979, Ober claimed that the mass starvation was simply due to neglect during Portuguese colonial rule, 
uh, Holbrook was not the only high official who had long served as an apologist for Jakarta, for the Jakarta regime. Stanley Roth, who served as Clinton's uh, Assistant Secretary of State uh, for Asia, had main cl maintained close personal friendships with top Indonesian officials since the late 1970s when he visited the country at the invitation of the Jakarta-based Center for Strategic International Studies. He was particularly close to Yusuf Wanandi, a top official at the C SIS who played a key role in secretly lining up U.S. support for the invasion of East Timor. After the um, Dili massacre, the Santa Cruz massacre in 1991, uh, again, that's when 270 unarmed East Timorese protesters were, were gunned down by the Indonesian uh, occupation forces, uh, and, and, and it led to widespread public outcry. Um, Roth uh, led the Pentagon's campaign to defeat the Feingold Amendment, which would have conditioned U.S. arms sales to Indonesia on human rights improvements in East Timor. During the debate, Roth said the U.S. would con maybe consider reducing arms sales, but only, after, only if Indonesia staged another massacre. Um, after a stint as Senior Director for Asia on the National Security Council, Roth acknowledged in the Washington Post that the driving dynamic of U.S. policy towards Indonesia was Washington's desire, quote, not to totally screw up the trade relationship, end quote, over human rights concerns or Indonesia's ongoing violations of uh, United Nations Security Council resolutions. With a team like that, it's not surprising that um, uh, Bush and Clinton's um, refusal to demand that Indonesia withdraw its troops from East Timor. Um, and indeed, as, um, as, as Clinton's ambassador to Indonesia, Stapleton Roy put it, Indonesia matters, East Timor does not. The large-scale arms transfers initiated under the Carter administration continued to flow under Reagan and Bush and Clinton. Uh, Congress had restricted taxpayer-funded U.S. training of the Indonesian military starting in 1992, but the Clinton administration repeatedly pushed for a resumption of full unrestricted military instruction and continued much of the training through new programs in an attempt to bypass the congressional restrictions. Um, Indonesia is not the only country to use American weapons to invade and occupy neighboring states, suppress indigenous populations, and violate UN Security Council resolutions calling for the withdrawal of occupation forces. We can look at um, countries like Morocco and Israel and Turkey. But, um, but, but, but Indonesia, I mean, the East Timor is far, far worse in terms of the um, humanitarian implications. And, and, and for 24 years, this policy challenged uh, Americans of conscience. And, and many Americans began to wonder, if the United States could fail to take leadership on an issue where right and wrong was so obvious, how could the U.S. ever hope to resolve more complicated issues like the Balkans or Israel-Palestine or, or others? And, and so pressure began to grow on the Clinton administration to end its unconditional support for Saharta's dictatorial regime, but you know, neither, um, and, and yet, yeah, you know, th there, there was a lot of resistance. I mean, you know, Clinton, like Bush, like Reagan, like Carter, like Ford, really, really didn't, didn't care that much about East Timor. The, indeed, ever since the invasion, the U.S. voted repeatedly with a minority of countries in the U.N. General Assembly opposing self-determination for that country. And um, despite close diplomatic contacts, including several summit meetings, the United States rarely raised the issue with Indonesian authorities prior to 1999. And the U.S. is one of the few countries to effectively recognize Indonesian sovereignty over the territory, albeit with the acknowledgement that the population had not been consulted. Meanwhile, on world maps, East Timor was depicted in the same color as Indonesia. No hash lines or dotted border or anything indicating that it was occupied territory. And the few times when there was a news story from East Timor, such as when Pope John Paul visited in 1989, the deadline said Dili, Indonesia, uh, not Dili, East Timor. In fact, the, the United Nations General Assembly had stopped their annual resolutions calling for an end of the occupation and their self-determination. And, um, and, and by the 1990s, while governments of two other occupied countries, 
Palestine and Western Sahara have been recognized by scores of countries around the world. East Timor had only been recognized by three governments, representing poor former Portuguese colonies in Africa. Still, within East Timor, there was continued resistance. Um, East Timor is a predominantly Catholic country where the church, like in Poland under Soviet-backed communist dictatorship and El Salvador under the US-backed right-wing dictatorship, uh, played a, a key role uh, in the resistance against Indonesia's uh, brutal occupation. Um, meanwhile, uh, in, the, in the mountains and jungles, there was the remnants of the armed struggle uh, when Fredland and the UTA united uh, to uh, you know, form an armed force which would occasionally ambush uh, Indonesian patrols. And there was also a growing nonviolent struggle going on uh, despite the, the uh, high risk uh, in, involved, uh, you know, torture and execution and, and imprisonment. But uh, we started to see the beginnings of a, an international solidarity movement. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and by having activists pressure their governments, these governments had to at least sometimes pass on to the uh, Indonesians their concerns. Uh, in 1988, the Indonesian regime finally began to open up East Timor to outside observers and foreign investors, which in turn, you know, which you know, allowed some of the news to leak out. And um, you know, there was the, um, you know, the, in the Santa Cruz massacre in Dili, in which hundreds of civilians were gunned down at the funeral of an uh, opposition activist. Um, it, this, un unlike previous massacres, it was witnessed and filmed by a small group of Western journalists, including Amy Goodman and Alan Nairn, who were, who were almost killed themselves. And this served as an impetus for human rights activists to press their case further. The following year, an award-winning Canadian documentary was released on the prominent linguist and political thinker Noam Chomsky, uh, which uh, prominently featured the tragedy of East Timor. Chomsky had been one of a small number of intellectuals who had been trying to bring attention to the uh, ongoing tragedy for years. And, and this film you know, led many, many thousands of uh, Americans, Canadians, and others to um, learn of what was going on there for the first time. A really big breakthrough took place uh, with the, in 1996, with the awarding of the Nobel Peace Prize to two East Timorese activists, uh, Bishop Carlos Bello and the de facto foreign minister in exile, Jose Ramos Huerta. And this really helped to mobilize public opinion in democratic countries around the world in support of the East Timorese cause. And it, it did become a cause. There were, there were ongoing protests in Indonesian uh, embassies and consulates the United States, Canada, Australia, Europe, and elsewhere. There was a, a famous case in Britain where a bunch of activists were uh, arrested on a railroad track blocking a munitions train that was delivering arms bound for Indonesia to a uh, British port uh, to be shipped uh, to, uh, to Indonesia. Um, uh, uh, attacks uh, by uh, Canadian uh, police against participants in a peaceful pro-East Timor demonstration at the um, Asia-Pacific Economic Summit in um, Vancouver in 1997, nearly brought down the government when it was revealed that uh, Prime Minister Kertien's office had promised the Indonesia that, that they would not allow protesters uh, to uh, embarrass the uh, visiting Saharto. Indeed, it became difficult for Indonesian leaders to visit a major Western nation without being dogged by pro-East Timorese demonstrators and reporters um, questioning uh, the country's East Timor uh, policy. The uh, Indonesians fought back, they and their allies in various countries uh, to, um, um, uh, to suppress this kind of thing. I, uh, in, in 1997, I organized a conference at the University of San Francisco on uh, Indonesia and East Timor. Uh, I allowed, I, I invited speakers who support the Indonesian um, you know, position as well, but the, the keynoter was uh, Jose uh, Ramos Horta. And I, I, I later learned that the um, that, that USF had ended up losing a, a half million dollars in donations uh, when they refused to cancel the event. Apparently some pressure from uh, 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 pro-Indonesian uh, funders. 
And interestingly, uh, that you know that for during that same West Coast visit, uh, Rama Shorta uh, was going uh, was going to speak at Berkeley, but the Southeast Asian uh, um, Center there, uh, which relied a lot on Indonesian Indonesian related money, wouldn't host him. Indeed, not a single academic department would host him, even though he was the contemporary Nobel Peace Prize laureate. Yeah. Uh, the only place he could speak in Berkeley was International House, which is a student co-op. Yeah. Uh, there, were, um, there, there were quite a, a few other episodes in which uh, you, you, uh, that um, uh, events trying to you know, publicize um, uh, the plight of East Timor or have Ramos Forcha speak or others, you know, got, you know, received enormous uh, pressure uh, not just by the Indonesian government, you know, but by um, uh, uh, powerful American business interest that had um, a lot of um, of, uh, of um, interest in um, in uh, Indonesia, now the fourth largest country in the world in terms of population, which had very uh, that was the um, home for. Um, uh, uh, Outsourcing a lot of, um, of uh, American industries, uh, they're infamous for their um, sweatshops, <laughs> where they make uh, running shoes and other uh, uh, sporting goods. Uh, mining interests are very important. Oil interest, uh, but but uh, as we've seen, unfortunately, in, in many Western uh, nations, despite the, um, uh, the the United States and Canada and, and, and European countries, uh, Australia, despite the rhetoric of supporting democracy around the world and very often have, have, have unfortunately uh, allowed uh, certain narrow uh, business and strategic interests to uh, trump the, um, the human rights values, the international law values, the um, uh, democr pro-democracy values. But um, <clears throat> despite this, uh, the, 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 the movement was growing uh, in solidarity with, with East Timor. Um, the, um, um, many of the, the, the churches uh, began to, the Catholic Church became more involved uh, speaking out about their co-religionists in East Timor, uh, uh, peace and human rights groups, uh, and starting with some um, uh, um, liberal Democrats in Congress, it spread to, um, to other, uh, from a variety of people with perspectives. In fact, ironically, uh, despite uh, you having Republican presidents like Gerald Ford and Ronald Reagan and uh, um, President uh, George H.W. Bush um, supporting Indonesia, uh, Republicans started going after Clinton about this uh, because they saw it was a you know, politically sensitive issue. They might gain some points on, particularly when it was discovered that in Clinton's re-election in 1996, he'd received some illegal campaign contributions uh, from some uh, um, wealthy Indonesian uh, business interests with close ties to the regime. In uh, 1997, after years of silence, um, editorials and in influential Western media, such as the New York Times and The, and the Economist, uh, finally called for self-determination for um, East Timor. Um, the Portuguese government and other governments became more emboldened to press the issue in international forums. Um, the, um, Great Britain, Australia, several European countries. Again, opposition parties, both the left and the right, found it politically expedient to, uh, to uh, challenge their government support uh, of the uh, Indonesian regime on the East Timor issue. Australia, uh, which was um, the, the, uh, one of the few countries to fully recognize Indonesia's annexation, securing a major oil concession as a result, finally called on East Timorese self-determination. And both the European Union and the uh, U.S. Congress passed resolutions supporting a, uh, a referendum. And this public opposition here in the United States uh, was largely responsible for the Indonesian government canceling its request for the purchase of U.S. fighter jets and military training in May 1997 because they realized they were not going to get it through and it would be a very heated battle, which would give even more bad publicity to their regime. Indeed, pro proposed arms transfers in Indonesia became major political battles in several countries. Um, and indeed, the United States, which provided 90% of the weapons used in Indonesia's initial invasion of East Timor, eventually passed a law prohibiting the use of U.S. weapons by Indonesian forces in the occupied country. 
And, and this, this, this moral pressure proved increasingly embarrassing for Indonesia, for foreign companies seeking investment opportunities in the country, as well as for allied governments seeking close diplomatic, military, and economic ties. And this is what finally created the momentum for a diplomatic solution to the problem in, in the hopes that um, Indonesia could finally wash its hands of the affair. And the United States and other countries did not want to see its ally weakened or distracted by East Timor, uh, particularly in the wake of the far more significant economic crisis that resulted from the uh, economic collapse in Southeast Asia, which began in 1997. So Harto had been able to hold on to his rule in large part because the economy was growing very, very rapidly, if, 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 if unevenly. Um, and uh, the, with the collapse, um, much of the regime's legitimacy collapsed with it. And in a uh, largely nonviolent and massive civil insurrection, uh, Suharto was overthrown uh, in, in 1998. And, um, and he was succeeded uh, by a, pre a President uh, Habibi, uh, who uh, immediately um, liberalized things, released political prisoners, um, uh, allowed for you know, pre free press and, and free elections. Um, and already facing enormous criticisms internationally for the decades of political repression, exploitative labor practices, poor environmental policies, the failure to adequately address the economic crisis. Uh, the, the moderate governments within the new Indonesian leadership hoped that by agreeing to a just solution on East Timor, it would um, prove to be a relatively painless way of, of, of um, easing international pressure. So in January 1999, Indonesian President Habibi announced that he would allow a vote to take place in East Timor for the East Timorese to choose their fate. Um, he said he would uh, uh, grant Timor a special status within Indonesia, uh, basically an autonomy proposal. The East Timorese, however, insisted that this apparent concession did not go far enough. So in May of that year, following a series of UN-backed talks, Indonesia and Portugal signed an agreement to allow East Timorese to finally have their say on their future in a referendum. A yes vote would mean autonomy under Indonesian sovereignty. A no vote would mean independence. And the United Nations agreed to administer the vote. However, the buildup to the referendum, which was scheduled for August 30th, was overshadowed by violence from pro-Indonesia militias backed by the Indonesian military. Despite all these threats, a massive 98 and a half percent of registered voters came out to cast their ballots, 98 and a half percent. And 78 and a half percent of these voters chose independence. In response though, Indonesian backed militia unleashed a wave of terror, massacring thousands, destroying entire villages, blowing up or seriously damaging the majorities of buildings in Dili and other cities. As many as 400,000 East Timorese fled into the mountains and indeed much of the infrastructure was destroyed. Uh, the main targets of the death squads were journalists, human rights activists, UN workers, supporters of independence and, and priests and nuns. Um, over a thousand people were killed including dozens of priests and nuns who were murdered in, in churches Convents were born to the ground, even with, with the religious and the parishioners inside. Dealey's Bishop, uh, Carlos Bello, the winner of the, 19, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize, temporarily fled the country, uh, barely escaping with his life. And uh, Bacal's Bishop, uh, Basilio Nascimento, was stabbed. Um, and, and, and if you look, if the repression, in terms of deaths and, and property destruction, uh, the people made refugees, uh, the repression that took place uh, it was as bad, if not worse, than what happened in Kosovo earlier that year. But the response of the United States and other Western nations could not have been more different. In the case of Kosovo, NATO launched an 11-week bombing campaign against Serbia. In contrast, the reaction of Western nations to Indonesia's terror was quite, quite limited. Um, this is despite the fact the legal case for intervention was actually stronger. While Kosovo was universally recognized as part of Serbia, 
the United Nations and virtually all the nations of the world recognize East Timor as being under an illegal foreign occupation. And I mean, no one suggested bombing the Indonesian capital of Jakarta as NATO had bombed the Serbian capital of Belgrade. That would have, wouldn't have been necessary. I mean, simply ceasing military cooperation and threatening to cut off further national loans to Indonesia's struggling economy were, were, were all it took that, that to force the government to stop the slaughter. But the Clinton administration did not do that until a full nine days after the slaughter began. At no point did Clinton or other international leaders threaten to freeze the extensive overseas assets of Indonesia's generals, which would have likely also stopped the assault in its tracks or, or nothing, uh, nothing like that. I mean, I mean, much of the delay was a result of the U.S. insistence that the international community needed Indonesia's permission to intervene with peacekeeping forces. But, you know, East Timor legally was no more the 27th province of Indonesia than Kuwait was the 19th province of, of Iraq <laughs> when during, during the uh, six month Iraqi occupation nine years earlier. And since unilaterally annexing a territory seized by mili military force does not give the occupier the legal right of sovereignty, Indonesia had no legal standing in determining whether peacekeeping forces should be allowed to enter the territory. And even as multinational peacekeeping forces were arriving, airdrops of food to starving East Timorese who'd fled into the mountains to escape the Indonesian's reign of terror were delayed because of the U.S. insistence that the Indonesian demand that their personnel be allowed to accompany the relief flights be honored, which required landing in Dili's small airport, which is made difficult by the stream of incoming peacekeeping forces instead of flying directly from nearby Australia. So, so you know, so, so in other words, you know, in addition to ignoring some of the most serious violations of international law and human rights in the past, during the past quarter century, even after voting for their freedom, uh, the United States and other Western countries stepped aside for this final spasm of, of, of violence by the Indonesians. Uh, the, but at least the, the Western media was finally paying attention to East Timor. Uh, the, this, this, the, this violence was getting front page coverage, unlike the, uh, you know, the, the even worse violence in which uh, nearly a third of the island's population had perished back in the um, late 70s and into the 80s. Unfortunately, even with the uh, new attention, the media often got their facts wrong, they, such as continuing to refer to the pro-independence East Timorese as secessionist and East Timor as a breakaway province. Um, the term secession can only be used if one is referring to separation from a country of which one is legally part. And for example, one does not generally hear Palestinians seeking statehood being referred to as secessionists from Israel. And East Timor could not break away from a country that it was never legally part of. And, and there, was some, there was some criticism in the media and elsewhere about the ineffectiveness and the naivete of the United Nations and promising the East Timorese that they would stay and protect the people after the vote. But the, unfortunately, the, the UN just had no forces of their own and they had allowed the Indonesian occupation forces to provide security. And, and while some blame does indeed lie with the UN, I think most of the fault, frankly, lies with the United States and other member states of the Security Council, uh, which refused to authorize the UN to have the kind of presence necessary to maintain the peace nor do they insist that Indonesian forces would draw prior to the referendum. And as evidence increased in the months prior to the referendum that the Indonesian armed forces were arming and training pro-integration militias, uh, and, you know, pressure mounted on the Clinton administration to insist that the Indonesians cut their ties. Cables intercepted by journalists indicated that Admiral Dennis Blair, chief of the U.S. Pacific Command, along with the U.S. military attache of the U.S. Embassy in Jakarta, it offered reassurances to the Indonesian military of ongoing strategic cooperation, just as the Clinton administration was claiming that it was finally getting tough with Jakarta. I mean, such a uh, perfidy is not new. I'm um, on two occasions since Indonesia's invasion of these team were back in 1975, the U.S. had publicly announced suspension of certain arms transfers and military training only to be exposed later as having continued them through some other program. But Admiral Blair, as the highest ranking U.S. military official in the region, 
work to undermine the Clinton administration's blatant efforts to end the repression, promote human rights, and support the territory's right to self-determination. He also fought off congressional efforts to condition support for the Indonesian military on improving their poor human rights record. Um, in, in April of 99, two days after a well-publicized massacre in which dozens of East Timorese civilians seeking refuge in a Catholic church in Lakika were hacked to death by Indonesian-backed death squads, Blair met in Jakarta with General Uranto, the Indonesian defense minister and military commander. Instead of pressuring Uranto to end his support for the death squads, he pledged additional U.S. security assistance, which, according to the Nation magazine, the Indonesia military, quote, took as a green light to proceed with the militia operation. Two weeks later, and one day after another massacre, Blair phoned Uranto, and rather than condemn the killings, quote, he told the armed forces chief that he looked forward to the time when the army will resume its proper role as a leader in the region. As the um, violence escalated in early September, the um, uh, Clinton administration initially denied the overwhelming evidence that the pro-integration militias were working closely with Indonesian armed forces and direct, engaging in the terror directly, uh, despite intercepted radio transmissions and eyewitness accounts fully available to U.S. officials. The Clinton administration also issued false reports that the Indonesians were getting the situation under control during the first few days after the referendum results were announced even praising the Indonesian imposition of martial law, uh, the impact of which was primarily to limit communication from the island to the outside world. Eventually, the U.S. acknowledged that some rogue elements of the Indonesian forces were involved, even though evidence suggests that the actions came from the very top of the armed forces and that General Waranto, commander uh, of the Indonesian armed forces, was um, playing a conscious game of brinkmanship to see how far he could go before prompting a Western reaction. Um, by mid-September, the U.S. had forced Indonesia to accept the Australian-led U.N. force into the territory, and, but they allowed the Indonesian forces to remain until the end of October. Now again, it's noteworthy that the repression ended only after the Clinton administration, under growing popular pressure here in the United States, announced the severing of military cooperation nine days into the post-referendum attacks. One wonders how many lives could have been spared, how much destruction could have been prevented if Washington had acted sooner. And indeed, you know, the, the, this whole tragedy going back to 1975 could have very likely been prevented were it not for the United States and other Western nations um, supporting Indonesia throughout the genocide. Now, subsequently, the um, Clinton administration, followed by the George W. Bush administration, uh, renewed its close relations with the Indonesian military. Um, in contrast to um, U.S. demands that Iraq pay compensation to Iraq, you know, to, sorry, in contrast to U.S. demands that Iraq pay compensation to Kuwait, one of the richest countries in the world, uh, following its six-month occupation in 1990-91, neither the Clinton administration nor any subsequent U.S. administration has similarly demanded reparations by Indonesians for East Timor, one of the poorest countries in the world, for the enormous destruction and looting during the final days of the occupation, again, well documented by the international media. And indeed, no Indonesian officials, none, not Suharto, or any of the military officers responsible for the massacres from 1975 through 1999 has ever been held accountable. Many continue to be feted by top officers in the American, Australian, and other armed forces which still cooperate closely with the Indonesian military. In addition, no U.S. officials have had their careers damaged over this. For example, Richard Holbrook, who played such a key role in the pro-Indonesian tilt in the 1970s, subsequently held a number of prominent positions in both the Clinton and Obama administrations, including uh, Clinton's ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, when he died suddenly several years ago, uh, when, he was in, when he was working in a high position in the Obama State Department, hardly any of the glowing obituaries mentioned his notorious role back in um, 1977 through 1980. Similarly, President Obama named Admiral Blair to be his director of national intelligence 
despite his well-documented uh, pro-Indonesian role in the final years of the occupation. Um, you know, the Washington Post uh, did report that Blair and other U.S. military officials took a forgiving view of the violence surrounding the referendum in East Timor. And I was interviewed on NBC Nightly News at the time and spoke directly to Blair's meetings uh, earlier that year, but it, it never came up uh, when um, Obama named uh, Blair to head the uh, DNI. In some cases, we've even had a rewriting of history. I remember during her presidential campaign four years ago, Hillary Clinton was praising her husband for supposedly helping to lead East Timor to independence. And then there's an incident that took place in Australia uh, several years ago when I was uh, speaking at a, a forum at, uh, on the uh, Arab Spring, actually, uh, the pro-democracy struggles that are taking place in the Middle East and North Africa at the University of Melbourne. I was there on a panel with Gareth Evans, um, who um, was uh, Indonesia's um, foreign minister uh, during the height of the repression in East Timor. Uh, he, was, he, was just, he was one of the big promoters and apparently played a role in convincing uh, Obama uh, to uh, intervene militarily in Libya uh, in support of the opposition rebellion against the Gaddafi dictatorship. In 2011, you know, one uh, intervention that we, we now know didn't end up very well. The country is still very much in chaos. Um, and Evans was justifying this, uh, the, what, what we refer to as a responsibility to protect on the grounds, you know, that, um, you know, that, that, that horrors would be inflicted. And I, I pointed out to him that at the time he called for intervention, uh, less than 500 uh, civilians had been killed by Gaddafi. Whereas as foreign minister, uh, he had um, covered up and uh, for Indonesian massacres, pushed uh, unconditional military aid and training for Indonesian occupation troops, um, you know, played a major role in Australia recognizing Indonesia's um, uh, you know, takeover. And at this point, uh, Gareth Evans <laughs> jumped up, ran over to me, grabbed me by the shirt collar and said, who the F are you? I ought to punch you in the effing face. Uh, this is an auditorium filled with people. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't realize it was an Australian rules conference, but uh, apparently um, he went in complete denial that he'd done any of these things, that he in fact had really supported human rights in East Timor and had really um, uh, uh, and, 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 um, had tried to influence the Indonesians to stop their repression. Um, and despite enormous amount of documentation, now not surprisingly, this incident got some media publicity. Uh, uh, in the Sydney Morning Herald, the country's leading newspaper, they reported the incident. But interestingly, they they did it in a manner sympathetic to Evans, and uh, and 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 similarly, the professor who organized the conference blamed me for the incident, saying I should have just spoken to him quietly. But it did. It, but you know, there are other people who wrote in and, and documented that indeed uh, uh, Evans had been a big supporter of Indonesia uh, during this this period. Um, Evans, I should mention, uh, has gone on to a number of important positions, including serving as head of the International Crisis Group and leading UN uh, uh, commissions and, and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, there. But um, but I think it underscores that that and, and why, why why I'm very pleased that uh, East Timor was included in this series is that a lot of people, because it's embarrassing, frankly, to a lot of Western nations, would prefer people to forget about it. And they'd forgive, forgive uh, they prefer people to forget about the role that uh, you know, that people um, like uh, Gareth Evans or, or Richard Holbrook or, or Admiral Blair or, or for that matter, uh, you know, presidents um, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, W. Bush, uh, you know, all these people who who have continued to support the. Um, Indonesia's um, repression, and you know, and and I, I think it's it's important to remember that you know, there's a tendency here in the United States and other Western nations when we hear about atrocities in places like Southeast Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Middle East to see them as part of some irrational primitive, so, uh, see them as, as part of some irrational actions by primitive peoples who failed to embrace the values that advanced uh, Western countries, that yet who provided the technology and the weapons to Suharto, 
to Saddam Hussein, to the Rwandan genocidaires, to the Central American death squads, and to others. You know, I mentioned that uh, documentary on Noam Chomsky. It was called Manufacturing Consent. And it's based on his, uh, his, his idea that, you know, there are atrocities by, by regimes all over the world. Um, some are supported by the United States and Western nations. Some are opposed by West, uh, the United States and Western nations. But it tends to be the atrocities committed by governments we don't like that to get the most attention. In Central America in the 1980s, for example, human rights abuses by the leftist Nicaraguan government got far more media attention, far more media attention than the, uh, the, the far, far worse human rights abuses by the uh, US backed uh, uh, government in El Salvador, which was responsible for nearly 80,000 uh, civilian deaths uh, during this period. And in neighboring Guatemala, nearly 200,000 people and uh, a in, in, in genocidal campaign against the um, country's indigenous populations. And yet, because El Salvador and Guatemala were US allies, it just didn't, didn't, get, didn't get the attention. I, I could give um, many, many examples of how uh, war crimes and human rights abuses and indeed um, uh, uh, mass killings that uh, in, in some cases do meet the uh, uh, legal definition of genocide have been uh, downplayed and ignored uh, if the uh, United, if, if the, the perpetrator was seen uh, as, a, as a, a government in which the United States had strong strategic and economic interest. Now, this does not mean going to the other extreme, the position of certain far left anti-imperialists who blame the US for everything and who, who then deny war crimes by regimes and, and armed groups opposed by Washington. Um, but what it does mean is we need to hold those who are responsible for atrocities into account, regardless of, of ideology. For example, for six years now, the United States has armed, trained, and facilitated, including targeting, in-flight flight refueling, and more, of what could be considered a genocidal bombing campaign by Saudi Arabia against Yemen. A bombing campaign which has targeted homes, marketplaces, and mosques directly, as well as disrupted the flow of needed food and medicines, has resulted in the deaths of many tens of thousands of people. Yet President Trump has insisted such support is vital to the national security interests of the United States and Congress has failed to stop it. 20 years from now, will I or somebody else be giving a talk to another group of Sonoma State students talking about US complicity in the genocide of the Yemenis, similar to my talk today about US complicity in the genocide of the East Timorese? It's something to think about. I do want to conclude on a hopeful note, however. True that by the time the Indonesian-backed militia left East Timor in the fall of 1999, the country was largely in ruins. Yet the East Timorese were finally free. That such carnage was allowed to take place is yet another indictment of US foreign policy. Yet the ultimate victory of the population of East Timor is a triumphant reflection of the power of ordinary people in both East Timor and around the world to triumph against enormous odds. The country has been slowly rebuilding, thanks in large part by large sums of aid and technical support to the United Nations. And, and despite its continuing poverty and, and political difficulties, uh, you know, the future uh, looks positive. And this is important to recognize because 10 or even just five years prior to independence, East Timor was widely seen as the ultimate case of realpolitik, of the triumph of brute military force over international law and human rights. The East Timorese resistance was down to a couple of hundred lightly armed fighters in the mountains against tens of thousands of Indonesian occupation forces. Nonviolent protesters routinely jailed tortured and killed 
the major major international players, the United States, Great Britain, Australia, were solidly behind Indonesia, as were all of Indonesia's neighbors, as was the Islamic world, and even major non-aligned countries like India. Uh, the United Nations had essentially given up. They even stopped their annual <laughs> resolutions. Um, and, and many of those, even those inclined to be supportive of East Timor, but believed it was a hopeless cause. And yet they won. And it was amazing just, you know, the, 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 the first Christmas after the end of the occupation, uh, the first, you know, it was amid all the destruction that had taken place in the previous months. It was the first Christmas East Timorese had ever celebrated free of Portuguese, Japanese, or Indonesian occupation. And a, a, a priest uh, there compared their celebration with the Dr. Seuss story of the Who's after the Grinch had stolen all their possessions. There was little to show materially due to the theft and destruction, yet they could still sing and celebrate. And the un unlikely triumph of the East Timorese is in large part a result of their own tenacity within their countries, within their country by exiles overseas and even through students within Indonesia quietly cultivating some limited support within Indonesia as the autocratic system began opening up. But much, much of the credit must also go to the many grassroots human rights activists around the world who kept the issue alive while most Western governments were in complicity with the repression and most of the world's media ignored it. Human rights organizations, the religious community and solidarity groups like the East Timor Action Network lobbied, demonstrated and worked, for the, and worked with the news media to the point where East Timor can no longer be ignored. So for all of us who've ever marched, written letters, committed civil disobedience, taken part in vigils, passed out leaflets or engaged in any other activity to challenge our government support for repression overseas, this is a vindication. East Timor proves that we can make a difference. We can, we can, still, we can continue to work to make a difference. We can work to end genocidal campaigns in Yemen, Burma, and elsewhere. We can work to end military occupations of Crimea, Western Sahara, and the West Bank. We can work to end human rights abuses from Burma to Iran to Egypt, Equatorial Guinea to Honduras. We can make it clear that human rights must be defended, regardless of the offending government's relations with the United States. Polls show that um, those of you under 30 are far more concerned about human rights than older voters. As a result, for human rights campaigns to succeed, we need your active participation. Hopefully, this lecture series will inspire you to become involved and make possible the rallying cry of never again. Thank you.